British comedian Spike Milligan once said, all I ask is for the chance to prove that money can't buy happiness. <laughs> I'd be happy to prove that too. Occasionally, usually when I hear about the 50 million lottery jackpots, I spend my time walking the dog daydreaming about what I would do if I won the lottery. And I have a pretty clear plan at this point, and I am very generous with most of the 50 million. <laughs> if only I actually bought lottery tickets. <laughs> and I suspect that many of us have daydreams about how good our lives would be if we won the lottery. Unfortunately, research on the lives of lottery winners suggests that it is absolutely true that money doesn't buy happiness. A study of lottery winners in Quebec found that five out of six winners felt they were better off before they won. And several studies repeat these findings, noting that the correlation between income and happiness is weak, almost negligible. Because we have natural temperaments that readjust after experiencing highs and lows of living. If you have an optimistic attitude prior to a terrible car accident, that optimism will eventually reemerge. If you were miserable before winning the lottery, you most likely will still be miserable, just with a nicer car. And yet, while I fully understand that money cannot buy the state of happiness, I'd still love the chance to prove it too. <laughs> because money does buy everything else. Money is essential to our lives. It's as basic and needful to our lives as bread and butter. To pretend that money is unimportant because the feeling of happiness can't be bought is missing the point. The minimum wage hasn't been enough to live on for years. Inflation is making retirement harder and harder for people. Our social services punish those who can't work by providing income inadequate to costs. For people with low or limited incomes, more money clearly makes life better. For anyone stressed about making it to the next paycheck or having to choose between food and heat or when any unexpected expense creates a huge problem, more money is absolutely better. It brings peace of mind and a degree of choice. The truth is that money is essential to our lives. We live in a global economy as much, if not more, than we live in a local ecology. Money matters. We depend on money the way we depend on bread and butter, naan and ghee, pita and olive oil, gluten-free wraps and vegan margarine. Not enough money is living on dry crusts and water, sometimes literally. That's why there's a rise in food bank use. So money is essential to our lives, which is why financial wellness is part of our wellness series. This is the year of healing and growing, of lifting up aspects of wellness through a Unitarian Universalist lens. And financial wellness, despite seeming like a strange topic for the spiritual community, given all of our white middle-class taboos about talking about money, financial wellness is truly an intrinsic part of our well-being. Our lives are shaped by our finances as much as by our education, our health, and our family. I know that in my 20s, having very little money had an impact on my wellness. Mm -hmm. I often felt like I didn't have options being underemployed. I worried constantly about paying the rent. Any slightly bigger purchase required careful, agonizing savings. And this wasn't just due to my circumstances, although I certainly was living on a below poverty income but it was also how I understood money. Just like John, I was raised by frugal parents. In my case, two people from working class families in England who grew up during World War II and all those years of rationing after. So despite living in a nice four bedroom house off Clarkson Road South, with my dad taking the GO train into work into his executive position in the downtown Toronto company, I thought we were poor. We lived on a tight budget, Every purchase accounted for. Many of my clothes were hand-me-downs from friends. We rarely ate out. My dad fixed everything that needed to be fixed. And we only ever camped for summer vacations. So I grew up understanding money as something rare and precious, something to be saved and only spent when absolutely necessary. And I lived with a great sense of scarcity. And it's taken me years to rewrite this script. 
Now, saving for the future is, of course, good to do, but that sense of scarcity, scarcity, that sense of never enoughness, turned me into a miser who found it almost impossible to be generous. Now, if you think of Gollum from The Hobbit, kissing my precious and hiding the ring from all eyes, you wouldn't be far wrong. And it took me many years and a more stable income to let go of that sense of money as a precious rarity. And Gollum is still there. It takes time and intention, but I began to see money as a tool, just as another way to express my values. And I wanted money to be less of a driver of my decisions, an easy excuse to say no. So I started to say yes. I wanted to be generous, so I began to make generous choices. And changing my attitude is one of the reasons why I'm able to leave you without knowing what my next job will be. Acting from a sense of abundance, a sense of trust is empowering, even as I am sad to part. Our Unitarian Universalist tradition says that how we live matters, that what we do each day, how we spend money, reveals our values, reveals what matters most to us. And so while Gullum still lives, lurks inside of me, I am more generous because I am part of a chalice community. Because this generosity required to create this spiritual home month after month, year after year, encourages me to have that sense of letting money move through my life. Who or where influences your stories about money? Money, like butter, is essential to life, but we don't treat it like another basic human need, like the right to food or water. As I said earlier, there's often a punishment, a judgment against those who can't or struggle to earn their own living. So what would it look like if we had a basic income guarantee if all of us knew no matter what, the bills would always be paid? There's a growing body of research which demonstrates that basic income is a good idea. Small scale experiments in places like Manitoba, Finland, and a Cherokee nation in the United States show a correlation with improved well being, reduced crime, and increased social trust. The, one of the arguments against basic income is that it will encourage laziness and people won't work. And I heard similar arguments about the federal pandemic support payments. And the story that underlies these attitudes, I think, is that people, well, other people, are weak, selfish, and lazy. But for Unitarian Universalists, a basic income guarantee expresses our values. Giving people money without strings attached shows a trust that people know best for themselves what they need. A basic income says every person has inherent worth and dignity, no exceptions. We say people are basically good. We're struggling and imperfect and flawed, but we're good. And I know which story I want to tell. I know which story I want our society to tell. Of course, it's easier to be good, to contribute to society, to be generous when we're well, when we're trusted, when we're respected when we have enough money to pay the bills. Financial well-being is essential to our overall wellness. And that's a challenge in our colonial, competitive capitalist system that we live within, because that encourages a story that money is earned solely through hard work, it's yours entirely to control, and you're only as worthy as what you earn. And this isn't true, of course, but we feel like it is but our inherent worth exists beyond our net worth. It's not how nice our stuff is or how far we travel, but who we are that matters. And this capitalist story based in white supremacy ignores privilege, inherited wealth, the exploitation of people and resources that our whole global economy is built upon and that increasing inequity in wages. The CEOs of Canadian companies earned the average worker's entire annual salary before 10 a.m. last Tuesday, January 3rd. Entire salary for the year that takes most people to earn. And I find that simply wrong. 
I don't mind disparity in income. Surgeons who cut into people's brains and hearts, midwives who deliver babies, the people who have to sort through recyclables and manage sewage. Frankly, I think they should earn lots of money for doing serious, meaningful, dangerous, and helpful vital work. But when the wealthiest people in the world, the 1% control over 30% of the world's wealth, that extreme is just too extreme. And none of those wealthiest people are midwives. <laughs> Part of our work uh, for the eighth principle is to dismantle those oppressive systems to full inclusion. And that actually includes our economic system, which is rooted in exploitation. Now, I don't know how to shift from a growth economy to a sustainable one, but I do know that one way to begin shifting the system is to question the stories it tells, the values it reveals. So when I began questioning my money story and saw that mindset of scarcity, I could then begin that slow shift towards generosity, choosing a story that better fit my values, my UU values. Basic income support is grounded in trusting and respecting all people. And those are UU values. There's a growing movement in nonprofits and charity work towards working with the people in need, letting them into the decision-making processes and taking their lead about what will actually help. These are UU values. Challenging the old narratives of capitalism and wealth and white privilege and control, Choosing instead financial stories of connection and sharing and trusting people, this is the way of the chalice. Money is as essential as bread and butter, yet there's so many taboos against discussing money sensibly. The only acceptable discussion in the sort of cultural narrative is how to make more money, how to grow your money. We barely talk about what money means. So it's no surprise we get all tangled up when we try to talk about money or if we have to deal with money. Money is the number one fight between couples, within couples. Financial conflict is stronger, longer lasting and the best predictor of divorce. And conflict over money can tear apart religious communities. And that's because money is so much more than loonies and toonies. It's about what we value. So we all have those personal money stories, frugal to a fault because of childhood understandings, maybe spending too much because of that short-term high from shopping, the blind spots that we live with when we've never experienced a sense of poverty. Knowing our money story is important. And in a few moments, we'll take some time to reflect on some questions about our financial experiences. But as we gain awareness of the values and meaning we ascribe to money, we can adjust and align those values. And as a congregation in a time of rising costs, with this change of ministry ahead of you, you have an opportunity to explore what money means to UCM as a collective and how it might be best be used, which does, of course, include fixing the roof. <laughs> I encourage you all in the days to come to continue to reflect on your financial well being. What stories do your finances tell? And what story do you want to tell? I know that I feel better when I live my values, when the way I use money or give money aligns with my desire to respect all people, to care for the earth, to dismantle oppression. And I fail as often as I succeed because the old stories are powerful and surround us. But every shift towards new money stories, those stories of sharing and trust, is a shift not just towards my own financial well being, but the well being of all. May we learn new stories so that all people everywhere are cared for in the fullness of their being. So say we all. <laughs>